on the screen, so let's stand singing it. I'm so happy. Everyone again. Number 140. the old rugged cross.
Another old song here, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. The Way of the Cross Leads Home. I must need Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we just thank you for the cross, and thank you for just saving our souls, Father, tonight. We pray that you'll be with us and guide us and lead us in the ones that's not here and can't be it's sick, and we pray that you'll just uh, reach down and just touch them. And we thank you for your word, and we pray that you'll be with Brother Matt as he stands before us and give us open hearts and open minds to receive your word. And thank you for your understanding. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. 1 I've entitled tonight's sermon, What Ministry Looks Like. What I'm going to be doing is, well, we're going to read Scripture. What Scripture, what I believe this section of 1 Thessalonians is teaching us about is Paul's ministry. It's kind of interesting if you look at what Paul does, for instance, when he's writing to Titus. He spends some of the time in Titus explaining to Titus, you're a leader in the church, this is what you need to look like. You're a leader in the church, this is what other leaders in the church look like. And he just spells it out for him very clearly. He does the same thing to Timothy in 1st and 2nd Timothy. And we look there very often if we want to know about leadership in the church. Timothy and Titus is where we go because Paul is talking to young leaders and explaining to them this is how you ought to be. In 1st Thessalonians, as we've discussed already, the church of Thessalonica started well, but under a lot of persecution. Paul was not really well received in that area, and so it was a time of a great deal of, of turmoil. So in Philippi, he was thrown in prison, and as soon as he got out of prison is when he went to Thessalonica. And he gets there, and even though there's a church that begins, 
It's done under hard times. So much so that he has to hurry to leave. Paul didn't get to set up his three-year exit strategy. All of a sudden there's a riot and now he's got to go. And so he does. But when he leaves, he's concerned about the church that he left behind. So eventually he sends Timothy back to see how are they doing. And there's a correspondence where Paul is not able to go back, but more than once he's sending Timothy as a messenger to hear how things are going along. And last week we looked at what it looked like for the church to be born. And we discussed that. And now Paul is moving on from what I think is the birth of the church to the church's growth, and it starts with good leadership showing them the way to go. And instead of talking to Timothy and telling Timothy, this is how you should lead, instead of talking to Titus and saying, Titus, this is how you should lead, what he's doing is he's saying, when we were there, this is how we led. So the points that I'm going to give you tonight is eight principles that I think ministers of the gospel should, should do. And it'll make more sense as we go through that. But as we look at these eight principles, what Paul is doing is he's saying, this is how we behaved in the church. And we as the church come behind and look at it. And we should be able to apply this and say, okay, this is how we as leaders ought to do also. So we ought to do as Paul did in this case. Now, this is one of those times that for me as a leader in the church, these words echo in my head. But I understand that if you're sitting out there, you might look at this and say, well, glad you know. <laughs> this is what we will hold you accountable for, but I'm glad you understand this is what you need to do. And there can be an attitude in the church of saying, well, I'm not a leader in the church, and therefore this doesn't apply to me. By the way, we do this all the time. One of the biggest ways we do this is with the call to being a deacon. Why in the world would we say that, the, that what deacons ought to be achieving is something that no one else in the church ought to do? Shouldn't that be the desire of every Christian to live as these qualifications has called us to live? Of course it should. And that was actually the point. And so, what we see Paul doing is saying, this is how I lived. And what I want you to do tonight is not say, this is how your pastor needs to live, although I'm, I am very willing to stand under the rod of correction that Scripture, that scripture brings. But I also want you to realize that there is no one here who is not a minister of the gospel. If you are a believer, you are a minister of the gospel. And so as we look at these points, don't look at these points as this is how we hold our leaders up, but look at this as this is how we ought to be. So with all that said, I'm going to read the scripture. It's, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12, and then we'll go back and look at the individual components. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but Though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts." For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like, nurse, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves." because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in the manner in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Amen. So, 
eight principles. The first of them is be bold. For you know your, you yourselves know, brothers, how our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel in the midst of much conflict. So, Paul's example to the Thessalonians was that we declared to you boldly what the gospel is, even if we were shamefully treated by outsiders, and even if there was conflict. Just looking at the surface of the gospel message, you might would think that there's no reason in the world anyone would ever complain. Matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. Jana and I have talked about this quite a bit. If you go to India, you can find people who are not Christians, but who are very willing to accept portions of the gospel. You could read their posts, actually, and really think that they're talking about the same God we're talking about with the things that they say and the way that they say it. I mentioned that this morning about Thanksgiving. It would be very easy. There is no place that I know of in this country that you could go to and be um, chastised for calling everyone to take a minute to say what they're thankful for. No one will be upset about that. You can, they would be happy for us to, and they would even say things like, you know, being thankful is really important to having a good life. Gratitude is how we get by. We need to recognize that, right? But change it just a little bit and say, thankful to God. Now, uh, it's not so favorably, well, who's, what do you mean? Because a lot of folks, what they mean by thankful is thankful to themselves. And it's very easy to go down that road. For instance, I have a wonderful marriage. I am thankful to God that God put Jana in my life. No question, that was God's hands. You look at our story of meeting. I was in Memphis for a week, and she was in Memphis for a summer. And yet we happened to be at the same place at the same time. I exchanged an email address with a girl at summer camp for the first time and only time in my life. Matter of fact, I was very, very hard on anyone that started relationships at summer camp. That's a dumb thing. You will never see them again. I have told that to many people. And yet, that's not always true. I did see her again. <laughs> but you know what it would be easy to do? It would be very easy for me to become thankful in me. Oh, I sure made a good decision. That was wise. I sure have a good judge of character. She's turned out to be everything that I could ever have wanted in a wife. I sure was smart. By the way, everything is true I'm saying about her, but my smartness in the matter is where I'm wrong. It was God's grace in the matter. So a lot of people are willing to be thankful, but if you really dig down deep, what are they really thankful for? They're thankful for themselves. And when you start saying, actually, the gospel tells you not that you're a wonderful person and you're making great decisions in your life, but you're a wicked person and you're making awful decisions in your life, you'll find that the same group of people that really liked that you wanted to come speak, now all of a sudden, eh, they're not really so happy to hear about it. And I, I, I'm not going to do it because it's going to feel like cherry picking. But I tell you, I can go through every issue that our nation is facing, from, from racial problems to COVID to um, the election, uh, you name it. And we can play this game where I'll show you what the gospel says about things, and you'll see that my, my comments are now dangerous, incendiary, just trying to stir up trouble. What's wrong with you? Just tell everybody, be happy and let's move along. And I say all that to say that there is a reason that Paul has to say, be bold. It's a warning to us that we as Christians can drift away from sharing the gospel as we want because we start sharing a portion of the gospel that has lost the cross. And that's the difference. It's the shame of the cross that the world hates. 
Paul had to say, and pray for me that I would have boldness as I ought. That should tell you something. If the Apostle Paul felt like he needed to ask the church to pray for his boldness, it is an easy thing to lose our boldness. Because he's a bold man. <laughs> and if he had to ask for the Lord's help, then surely we need to ask for the Lord's help. So, Paul says, we just left Philippi and you saw we were shamefully treated. We came to Thessalonica and again there was trouble, but you saw we stayed bold. We continued to be bold. I said some things, I believe it was last Sunday night, about disciplining our children. That, quite frankly, it is very difficult for me to say on something that I know is going to YouTube. Because there are people in this nation who would say that I don't deserve to have children living with me. It is a hard thing for me to say, but my, my God has told me to do it this way. And I'm not doing it out of anger, and I'm definitely not doing it out of hatred, I'm doing it out of love. But I am convicted, convinced that this is how my God has told me to raise my children. And the nice, easy, safe thing for me to do is just to never mention that hard stuff. But we're told to be bold, even if we're shamefully treated by others, even if there's conflict. Secondly, ministers of the gospel should have a truthful appeal. Verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Paul, not only does he tell us that our appeal needs to be of the truth, he tells us three ways that we might wander from the truth in our appeal. What is the appeal of the Christians? That you, sinner, will come to Christ to be saved. That's the appeal of the Christian. And as we do that, notice, first off, there's no error. It is my job as a minister of the gospel, to understand when I speak how I am speaking correctly from God's word. It is your job as a minister of the gospel in your homes, with your family, and in your work, with the people around you, that you understand scripture so that you can present the gospel clearly without error. It's your job. And again, I think sometimes we've surrendered this to the professionals if you know someone who wants to get saved, what do you do? Why don't you come to church with me? You can hear your, the professional give you the gospel in a professional way. No. Sure, let them come to church. That's great. But you share with them what God has done. You show them the way to know Him. And you can't do that unless you know. And you need to know rightly so you don't cause confusion. So no error. Secondly, no impurity. How many times is our, man, I've been around, I've listened to people debate on behalf of Christians that I wish they would be quiet and walk away because I knew their lives and I knew the people listening said hypocrite and that was the end of it. Matter of fact, it's been, there have been times I've listened to someone and I thought, oh no, I didn't know you were supposed to be a Christian. I know that sounds awful, but their lives and what they say are so distant from each other that you know the gospel does not go forth from them. And Paul warns us of that. He warns us of that by saying, when I came to you, there was no error in what I said, and there was no impurity of my life. You looked at me. And again, as your pastor, I am very ready to stand under the microscope and say, if there is impurity, show it in me. Not that I'm perfect, but I want to repent. I don't want it to be there, just like you don't want it to be there. But let me turn it on you and say, that should also be your desire, not just mine. That you are ministers of the gospel as well. And so there should be no impurity in you either. Thirdly, no deception. It's funny how words come and go. There, there's, a, there's a phrase that in evangelical Christian, um, Christianhood, Christianity, we've moved away from. 
we used to talk about winning souls. And what we meant in the 50s and 60s when we said how many souls were won for Christ is that we recognize when we talk to a person that they are a person whose soul was created in the image of God. And we love them not just, just as, as, as someone who's going to be here for 20 years, but someone who is eternal, and their soul is eternal. But unfortunately, there have been, I don't know any other way to say it, deceptive soul winners. There was a book put out that explained how you can help someone become a Christian in the same way you can convince someone to buy a vacuum cleaner. Put your hand on their back in this way and they'll feel the presence of God. It, it was very manipulative. And honestly, when we have a time of invitation, there is a fear that I have sometimes that we sing songs to try to convince people to come to Christ. By all means, I want to convince people to come to Christ. If you're not a, a, a Christian, everything in me wants you to understand that your soul is on the line and I want you to be saved. But it's not so that we can count number of souls this year. And it's definitely not so that, so that we get any credit or any glory or anything else. And I think what Paul is saying, you saw that you got the whole picture. I did not deceive you. When we present the gospel, we need to present the wonderful news that we will live forever with God, and we also need to present that this life you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. We need to not be deceptive. We need to have a truthful appeal. Thirdly, we need to be approved by God. Verse 4, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our heart. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. What does it look like to be approved by God? It starts, it looks like, with not trying to please man. Not having flattery. And notice, he says, you can bear witness that we didn't flatter you. And I hope that after I've been here 10 years, that you might be able to say of me that I was encouraging, but that you would not be able to say of me that I was flattering. Hope that I will be bold to declare the truth as it stands. And all of us, under the truth of God's word, will have times that we are flat out not flattered. <laughs> Corrected would be a better term. And so he calls on them to say, you know I didn't flatter you. But he also said, I was also not greedy for gain. And now he doesn't point to them, but he points to God. He says, God is my witness. I was not greedy for gain. You see, at the end of the day, you can't read my heart about greed. Only God can. Now I want to again turn it to you. That as you present the gospel to those that you're around, that you would recognize it's not about being pleasing to man. That it's not about flattering others around you. It's about being honest. That it's not about greed. And you might not think of this in terms of financial greed, but maybe... Love greed. If I say nice things, they'll say nice things and we can all feel nice. God knows your heart. God knows why you care and it's important. So not for greed and not for glory. And those things are pleasing to God. 
Again, I, because I've, I, I've spent quite a bit of time on college campuses, I've watched all kinds of different arguments and debates and discussions. Sometimes the person who's debating really wants more than anything else for people to be impressed by them. Matter of fact, this is something that I was deeply convicted of in high school that I realized I loved a good fight because I was pretty good with my words. I could hem people around and make them say they were confused and didn't know what they were thinking. And, and you know what I was really doing? It's like a football game. I was trying to beat them. It had nothing to do with the truth, although I was convinced I was right. It had everything to do with the glory of being the one who won the argument. And I can tell you that my own sin, what it cost me was many years of being, having to put myself last in that regard. That the Lord needed to beat out of me the desire for glory. And even now, the temptation can come. And I have to say, no, it is not about winning an argument. If all you want to do is argue, go talk to a wall. Because <laughs> I'm not trying to do this for my glory anymore. And those things, not pleasing man, not, being, not having flattery, not being greeting, not doing it for glory, if we'll stick to away from those negatives, then we will please God. What are those opposites? Trying to please God and not man. Not trying to flatter, but to be truthful. Not greedy, but doing it for our love for others. Not about what we can take, but about what we can give. Not for our glory, but for God's glory alone. That's how we're pleasing to God. Verse 7, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her, her own children. He's actually going to use the parent image twice. First one here is as a mother, and just a little while as a father. But what is it that a mother does for his children? For her children. She's gentle. She cares for them. And so, we're called as ministers to be gentle. By the way, this is not easy. When you have kids, eventually they get hurt. And sometimes they get hurt in a way that requires pain in helping them. So for instance, I remember one of our kids got a cut and I had to pull the cut together so that we could tape it up. That was painful. It was very painful. And that child was really tough to put up with that. But in that, I see, I think, the picture of what Christian ministry looks like. That at the one hand, I had to be firm and honest and just kind of turning my back on it and say, oh, you know, it's okay. It'll be fine. I like you that way. I had to say, no, no, this has to be fixed. Here, let me help you. And amidst the cries, <laughs> to do what needs to be done, and yet at the same time, to do it in a manner of gentleness. That's tough. And I think the picture of a mother is a good example of what that looks like. To be gentle as a nursing mother with her baby. Verse 8, be compassionate. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. What does compassion look like? Compassion looks like sharing the gospel. Compassion also looks like sharing ourselves. Sometimes sharing the gospel is an awful lot easier than sharing ourselves. 
but we're called to. At least Paul was called to, and I think that this is an example for us to follow. And what he said is, because you were dear to us, we shared with you the gospel, and we shared with you ourselves. Are you willing to share yourself with others? What does that even look like? Jana and I had a standing policy that I always let her know. No. We did have a standing policy that I always let her know when I was coming home. I wasn't always good at it. I'm not always good at it. But I will try to let her know. But she did know there was one exception. That if I was at school, and this happened a lot more when I was a graduate student than now as a professor. But as a, as a, as a graduate student, if there came up a conversation that had to do with witnessing for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, she understood that I would not stop in the middle of the conversation to let her know I'm going to be late. That's the one time, because very often the conversation would be over if I stopped. And so it was one of those things that I would still call her and i said, I'm so sorry, I didn't have a chance to call. I had a conversation with so-and-so, and it turned this way, and I knew if I stopped that we would quit having the conversation. And she understood that I had to give of myself to that conversation. And that she had to give of me. And that I had to give up her, because our time together is important and we enjoy it. And that was not as a pastor. That was as a lay person. And I would challenge you to recognize that you will not be a minister for the gospel until you are willing to share not just the gospel, but also yourself. What does that look like? That is what it means to, have, to be compassionate for others. That you can look at others and say, they are dear to us. I could name five people that I, that during those years that I was talking to on a regular basis. None of them accepted Christ. All of them are still dear to me. I care about the decisions that they're making. Verse 9, be hardworking. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Notice, there's a lot here. First off, you remember our labor and our toil. Labor means pain. Um, I've, I've shared with you quite a bit that my dad is a hard worker. I think my dad would say that he loves to labor, but I also think that he understands labor is pain. This is, true, this is a true story, that when I carry something heavy that two people are carrying, I honestly expect that the way to do that is to be nearly falling the whole time. You just fall as fast as you can in that direction. Don't let the ground catch you. You go. Because that's how he moved. That's what labor looked like. There was no getting up a bucket and just moving our way. It was get the bucket pointed ahead of you so you're falling that way and you just try to keep up. I'm not saying that's the right way to work for 40 hours a week or 60 or however many hours you work, but I am saying that's what labor is. It's tough. That's what this word means. It means much more than just I put in my nine hours at the desk waiting for the phone to ring. It meant pain and pushing hard, much more like a, a woman in labor, although the second word means even more that way. Labor and toil. So, with the word labor, there is, there is the, the understanding that this is coming with pain. And the word toil, there is understanding that this comes with a hardness and even with a sadness. When you minister to other people, when you begin to care about people who are wandering from God, it will break your heart. Amen. 
And Paul says that you saw when I was among you, I was laboring. It was painful. I was toiling. It was sad. It was hard. It was not just Sunday morning for an hour. It was day and night we were laboring alongside you. Why? So that we would not be a burden. When I was about, when I was called to preach when I was 12. And for years, what I said about that call was that I felt like I was called into ministry. And the longer I went not being a pastor, the more I thought that maybe what God meant was that I needed to be his servant, which I was anyway. When I was about 16, reading about Paul saying, I don't want anyone to take this boast from me that I paid my way with my own hands, that became something that I earnestly prayed. Matter of fact, that had a lot to do with the major I chose in college. When looking at what I could do, my goal was to go overseas and work as a missionary, but to be able to pay my own way as an engineer. I thought those two things worked together well. I had no idea what God's final plan would look like. Matter of fact, I'm not dead yet, so I don't know that I know yet what God's final plan for my ministry is. But I had no idea that he would bring me where we are now. But I'll tell you this. It is a great joy of mine to know that I can work hard for you so that I'm not a burden. And man, y'all bless me over and over and over. And I know I have a hard time accepting it, and thank you for your patience in recognizing I have a hard time accepting it. Because my deepest desire is to be like Paul was. He was not a burden to anyone. He served God and everyone knew it had nothing to do with money. It had everything to do with serving God. May that be true in my life and may that be true in your life as you also minister the gospel. That people are willing to say, you know, that, that guy goes out of his way to care for us. Boy, that lady will put herself, she'll lose a lot of sleep over me. Paul said he worked hard. Seventhly, have good conduct. Conduct. Ministers of the gospel could ha should have good conduct. Verse 10. You are our witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Three different ways, he says, to have good conducts. Conduct. Holy. We talked about that last week. Holy means not doing the things we should not do. Righteous. That means doing the things we should do. And blameless. That means being an open book. People can tell what your life looks like. That was our conduct toward you believers. As ministers, we ought to do the same. And then finally, be faithful in calling for holiness. Verse 11. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. There, is a lot, there are a lot of folks in Christian ministry today who would like to ignore that this is in Scripture. They're only going to focus on the fact that Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died for your sins. Be thankful. Like we talked about this morning... Judah wasn't worth it. God had to redeem him out of his grace, not out of Judah's goodness. Make no mistake about that. But also make no mistake that the New Testament is filled with a calling to live a holy life. And that's actually the part that makes people uncomfortable. 
We could fill this church up if we're willing to say, everybody's broken, it's okay to be broken, enjoy your brokenness, and let's all have a good song. We could fill this church up. People love to hear that kind of thing. What they don't like to hear is, you know what, you're living in sin and you need to stop it. Ooh, now we don't like that. And yet that is the very thing that Paul says. He says, and you know that we did not stop telling you to live a righteous life. Let me read it again. You know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own glory and kingdom and glory. Exhorted. Encouraged. Charged. Oh, the joys of fatherhood. There is something special about having the ability to encourage your children and to know that they listen carefully to what it is you encourage them to do. It's humbling to know that as a father, you fathers have the same power that I do with my children, that you can lift your children up and you can break them down with your words. You encourage them, and they'll stick with it. So when they're doing right, you encourage them. You exhort them when they're doing wrong. And except for the remote on our couch, everything else they do. <laughs> I'm joking, that's, that's a pet peeve of mine that we can never find our remote. But I, I will say this, that when I call on our children, I want you to remember this, they remember. Matter of fact, there will be times I, I do it accidentally where I'll say, from now on, everyone do this. And two years later, why would you do that for? Well, you told us to. Oh, I did? And, you know, it was a passing comment that I didn't necessarily mean for that to be an eternal edict. But our kids, I had exhorted them. And so that's what they were going to do. And that's what Paul is saying. Like a father with his children, as ministers, we encouraged you, we exhorted you, and we charged you that you would walk blamelessly. Man, what a challenge. What a challenge for me as a pastor. I know I've said this to you a lot, but please understand, if I ever come to you and exhort you, First off, I don't like doing that. And secondly, I have no choice about that. I have to be obedient to my God. And I have been called to do that. And also understand stand this, that you too are ministers of the gospel. You also are called to do that with each other. There are two things that this calling for holiness does. And I'll, I'll end there tonight. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This calling for holiness that, that we are called to continue to do expresses God's kingdom and expresses God's glory. We're not talking about holiness for holiness' sake so that we can pat ourselves on the back and say how wonderful we are. Read back through there. There's a ton. We've talked about that already. What we're talking about is holiness for God's sake. Two reasons. First, so that God's kingdom would come in answer to Jesus' prayer. Which, by the way, don't you think that God will answer Jesus' prayer? No question He will. So when Jesus prayed... Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That that prayer is being answered, no question. And one of the ways it's answered now is in our lives as Christians. 
The kingdom of God is in us as we live our lives as Christians. I heard, um, this came out of Scotland, I believe. One of the marks of revival coming to town is horoscopes go out of business. I thought that was an interesting marker of what it looks like when revival comes. Why? People turn to God instead of to other things to know what's going on. And I say that to say, when revival comes, the world around us changes. That as we live, I had a, a Chinese friend, and he was telling me in, this was five years ago, in five years ago's climate, he was amazed at how safe things were. He talked about, you know, in China, we've got to lock things up a whole lot better. People steal it out. If you, know, if you can't catch them, they'll steal it, whether you're watching or not. And I was thinking to myself, you have no idea. I grew up where the keys stayed in the ignition so you didn't lose them. It was the only place we had them. That our doors were never locked when we left home. Never. Never thought about that we ought to lock our doors. Why? And I'm not saying America is perfect. That's not what I'm saying at all. I am saying that there was a time where people were moral. And you got a glimpse of what God's kingdom might look like. And again, no, by no means was it perfect. And you can look and you can find all kinds of flaws. And I'm not, I'm not ignoring them. I'm just saying that I remember a day when I was not concerned about what was in my car. And I think it had to do with people that loved God more than anything else. So God's kingdom coming, and also God's glory. I want to be holy because God's name is attached to me. It's, I'm not worth it. I sure don't deserve it. But man, am I thankful that God has chosen to call me his servant. That would be good enough. But beyond that, his child. And so if God is putting his name on me, then my holiness reflects the glory of God. And I want that. And if you're a believer, you also are a minister. You need to want that. <laughs> that God's glory is, is declared in your holy and blameless life. This is one of those sermons that at the end I try to wrap it up and I try to say, okay, so what can you get from this tonight? And I can't do that tonight. Because what I would say is, I'll give you eight things you could get from tonight and we'll go, <laughs> we'll start again. Because really this entire sermon has been nothing but application. How do you, as a Christian, change your life to line up so that your example looks like Paul's example? By the way, this church succeeded. God did wonderful things in Thessalonica. And I believe a lot of it had to do with Paul's willingness to serve as God had called him. So are you willing to serve? Are you willing to be bold? Are you willing to be truthful? Are you willing to do what it takes to be approved by God? Getting rid of all the stuff that, that breaks us away from God's will. Are you willing to be gentle and compassionate, and hardworking, giving of yourself? Are you willing to change your conduct for the furthering of God's kingdom? Are there shows that you're willing, that you enjoy that you're willing to say, I will no longer do this because it does not further God's kingdom? And are you willing to be faithful in calling others into that holiness? It's tough. That's my prayer for you. That's prayer, my prayer for me. So let's stand and sing.
312. You can, you can be seated. Um, this evening we, we've announced and so we need to enter.